Last week we started talking about the Hajj of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, and we'll continue with that today. There are a lot of details that as we're going over there I'm going to skip, which we'll come back to as I'm talking about the spiritual connection or the reality of what's being done, inshallah. Uh, now last week we mentioned you know, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he leaves Medina Munawwara, they come to Dhul Halifa, which is just outside of Medina Munawwara. Uh, he spends the night there. Next day, does ghusl, dawn the ahram, and then continues from there. Get to uh, uh, Aruha, which is a place where he said 70 prophets made salat there. Uh, all of these were coming for Hajj. That's why they made salat there. Uh, the and then you know I mentioned when I said that when they arrived at uh, I said Azraq which which I'm pretty sure that's what I said uh, which should have been Araj and so I you know kind of skipped or ch changed the name there is Araj and that's where you know the luggage was missing and you know and we talked about that last week I'm not going to go into those details today um, as the journey continued. You know, people would come and they would ask various questions about Hajj. You know, how to make the Hajj, and you know, asking him, and he would be explaining these things as they were as they were traveling. When they arrived, not too far outside of Makkah, you know, Bibi Aisha Siddiqa, Salamu Alaihi, her monthly issue started. And so when that happened, you know, she said that, oh, you know, my whole trip has been wasted. Uh, you know, how will I do the Hajj? And the Rasulullah Sallallahu he consoles her and he says that this is an issue or this is a, a thing that happens to every woman. And then he explains to her how to do the Hajj in this condition. And when we understand what the Hajj or the main part of the Hajj actually is, then it becomes very evident as to how it's done. When he arrived at the place which is Azraq, here he says, to the companions, he says, you know, I am seeing that moment when Musa al Islam passed through here with his ear or with his fingers in his ears, calling loudly the Labbaik, you know, the Talbih, Labbaik, Allahumma Labbaik. So, again, every prophet made Hajj, all of them made Hajj, all of them responded to the call, and all of them fulfilled the call, you know, even Nuh alayhi salam. He made tawaf of the Kaaba in his ship. So, you know, we know that you know that ship or that ark, it passed through that area and it made tawaf of the Kaaba, you know, as it's floating. And Nuaz al Islam of course is in there. So all of them made the Hajj. Which is also interesting because I was listening to this rabbi and he was talking about you know, if you look at like Orthodox Jews when they do their worship, they tie this block either to their arm or to their skull. This black block box, you know, cube form that they tie to them to themselves and as they're worshiping. And she so was explaining that Musa al Islam when he left Egypt and he crossed the sea, he actually he says that he actually went to Mecca and he made the, and he went there. And then he came back, when he came back to the people, to his people, he brought this form of worship, 
And in his wording, he said that he changed this pyramidal, py pyramidical form of worship to this cubical form of worship. And the thing is, he's not saying this because he has some sympathy for the Muslims. You know, because his point was that, oh, see, Makkah is actually ours, so we need to go and take over it too. That was his whole point of admitting that Musa al-Islam came there you know, after he, he crossed over the sea, or crossed through the sea, rather. And then he joined his people again, bringing this, again, as he said, you know, this cubical form of worship. Um, which, you know, you think about this, you know, very interesting. Also, you know, Musa al-Islam, he goes there. What he didn't mention, and which is which was something that we know, that he also passed through the alleys and the and the passageways of Mecca. But on the way back, he also stopped in what was then Yathrib, and he walked through the passageways of Yathrib. And if you look at Musa al Islam, he's interesting among the prophets. Everyone has that desire to see Allah. But there's no mention of any of the prophets actually asking this question. That oh Allah allow me to see you. Except for Musa al Islam. So why is Musa al Islam different than all the rest of the prophets? And this lies in him being Kalim Allah. He is the one who spoke to Allah with no veils, no curtains in between. He is speaking to his Lord, you know, with nothing in between. All the other prophets, they spoke to their Lord through a mediator. Even Jibreel al -Islam, when he speaks to Allah, it's not a direct speech. There are curtains in between. With Musa al -Islam, there's nothing. So it's this overwhelming desire for the one that you're speaking to that you want to see. You know, when you're talking to somebody, you know, even on the phone, you'd much rather do the video phone than, the, than just the phone, because you want to see who you're talking to. Right. So, this is why Musa al Islam, but then what happens when Musa al Islam says, Ask Allah, oh Allah, allow me to see you. Allah subhanahu wa responds with, Lantarani. You cannot see me. And this explains to us why he came to, the, to Medina Munawwara, again, which at that time was Yathrib, and why he walks through the alleyways of Medina, and why he's walking through the alleyways of Makkah. Because there he's told, Lantarani, you cannot see me. And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands Rasulullah to say, Marra'ani, Faqadra al haq That whosoever sees me has indeed seen al haq The truth, al haq Allah. An interesting point here, even Abdul Aziz bin Baz. You know, he mentions this narration as say. You know, he's, he used to be Grand Mufti of, of Saudi Arabia. So even he acknowledged this as correct. So he Marrani Faqadr al Haq. Because he is also the only one of the prophets who verbalized his desire to be among the Ummah of Rasulullah. Oh. Because he understood this point and this overwhelming desire to see Allah, but he cannot see Allah directly. So he will see this great. He wants to see the greatest sign of Allah, which is Rasulullah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now, kind of looking at this even further, Musa al-Islam says, "Oh Allah, allow me to see you." Rasulullah also never asked that. He didn't need to ask that. He was sent as as shahid, as a witness to what? To all of creation. But above that, a witness to the Creator Himself. And if someone doesn't acknowledge that he was sent as, as this, 
then you have to acknowledge that on the night of Miraj, that he sees his Lord. And Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, when he was asked this question, you know, did he literally see him? He said he saw him, he saw him, he saw him, he saw him. And he said this until he ran out of his breath. Emphasizing this point. And in the hadith in Sayyid Bukhari, when, when Rasulullah himself is asked, did you see your Lord? He says, yes, I saw him as Noor. So he didn't need to ask. Musa al-Islam needed to ask. And he asked, and he got that answer. He says, well, if I can't see you directly, I want to see your beloved, sallallahu alayhi wa And if I can't, and, and if I'm not at a time when I can see the beloved, then everything associated with the beloved is beloved. I'll go through the alleyways and, and you know, the, wherever he walked, I want to walk that path. So after this, you know, after telling the companions that he is seeing, he sees that moment. You know, it's not like, oh, you know, I'm imagining this. I am seeing that moment. So after he tells them this, then they continue on. They get to a point called the door. And here, they rest. They stop. You know, they spend the night. The next morning, he makes whistle again. And they enter. Makkah that morning, you know, around mid-morning is when they enter in this, the fourth of Zilhaj. So it's a nine-day journey that they've taken. He enters Makkah, immediately goes to the Kaaba, and immediately starts the Tawaf. He kisses Hajar Aswad. When you enter the when you enter Masjid al-Haram, there is no Tahiyatul Masjid. It is the the reward of tawaf is greater than the two rakat. So that's why you don't do the two rakat, you simply do tawaf. So he comes, he kisses Hajjah Aswad, he starts the tawaf, he makes the tawaf, he goes to Maqam Ibrahim, he makes two rakat. First rakat, he recited Surah Kafirun, Qul Ya Yuhul Kafirun. Second rakat, he recited Surah Ikhlas, Qul Huwa Allah Hu Ahad. From here, he goes to Safa, he climbs up on Safa, and looking at the Kaaba there, he stays for a long time making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, all of the dua of Rasulullah are for the forgiveness of the Ummah. And then, coming down from Safa, then he makes the say between Safa and Marwa, seven times. One time is from Safa to Marwa, two is back to Safa, three, four, five, six, and you end it at Marwa. Once he completed this, now he gives the order that whoever did not bring animals for sacrifice, they should come out of the ihram. Those who have brought their animals for sacrifice, they can stay in the ihram and do the haji qiran, which we spoke about last week. Everybody else was ordered to come out of the ihram. This is important point here, or an interesting point here is, you know, and this is why I mentioned that Ali Radim was sent to Yemen, you know, before Rasulullah made the announcement for Hajj, in charge of the army. While in Yemen, they received news that Rasulullah is going for the Hajj, so they immediately set out that they want to join Rasulullah in the Hajj. When Ali Radim realizes that the army is moving too slow, that they're not going to make it in time, he leaves the army and he comes you know, because he can make it a lot quicker on his own. However, he gives an order to the army. You know, they have the spoils of war. And he says that that they are not to put on these clothes. That and you know, Yemeni clothes were considered very I guess, you know, like very, very good clothes clothes to that then. You know, it was top notch clothing and, and anyone who was wearing Yemeni clothing you know, it's like he's very well dressed. So, Ali Radu had given the order that no one is to put on their clo that cl those clothes that they've received in the spoils of war. Because he wants the Rasulullah system to distribute the spoils of war. And these will be important points to remember as we go forward. 
I'm not going to go into the details of them right now. So you give this order, you know, that no one is to put on those clothes, you know, and until Rasulullah himself distributes them. The thing is, this army has been traveling for four months. You know, there's no, you know, dry cleaner or, or you know, cleaning station in between. So, you know, in the middle of the desert, traveling for four months, you know, your clothes get a little dirty. So the people were anxious to put those clothes on. Ali then gives this order and he sets out. He arrives in Mecca. When he arrives in Mecca, Rasulullah, you know, with his ihram on, he makes the dua. He comes to the Rasulullah after the Rasulullah has given this order that whoever has not brought their animals for sacrifice come out of the ihram. He is nafs al Rasul. You know, he is the self of Rasulullah. This, of course, is proven in the Quran. He comes to Rasulullah and says, Ya Rasulullah, so you're given this order, you know, but I don't have any animals. I mean, I'm coming from, from there. How, so, but I want to stay in the ihram. You know, I want to be, I want to do the hajj the way you're doing the hajj. So, Rasulullah says, but I've given this order. And this is the command that whoever has not brought their animals, they have to come out of the ihram. So he says, Ya Rasulullah. Find a way out for me. You know, because he understands. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent Rasulullah with the authority to make the rules and to also to make the exceptions to the rules. So finally, then Rasulullah says, Fine. I brought a hundred camels, which he had brought for, to sacrifice for himself. He says, 37 are yours. So he kept 63 for himself, one for every year of his life. He says, the 37, they are yours. So you can stay in Ihram. So for the next four days, again, they entered Makkah on the 4th of Zil Hajj. So for the next four days, you know, everybody's waiting. They come to the masjid, make their salat, you know, regular life. And then, on the 8th of, of Zil Hajj, those who have taken their ihram off, that morning they put their ihram back on, and they set out for Mina, which is just on the outskirts of Makkah. So, basically, after Fajr Salat, or actually in the morning of, of the 8th of Zil Hajj, they set out for Mina. They arrive in Mina, and they make five salat here. So if they arrive before Dhuhr or around Dhuhr time, they make Dhuhr salat, then later that day Asr, Maghrib, Aisha, the next morning, Fajr. That afternoon, Allah SWT revealed Surah Mursalat, which is Surah number 77. So when you go home, read the, at least read the translation to that. Surah number 77, last surah of the 29th Juz. So then on the morning of the 9th, after Fajr Salat, as, as the sun is rising, or as the sun rises, they set out from Mina for Arafat. And Rasulullah when he arrives in Arafat, you know, he's on his, on, and he's riding, the camel he's riding is Qaswa. You know, this is his, his camel. Right. So he's on Qaswa, and, you know, they have set up a tent. You know, there is a Masjid Nimrah in Arafat. So, you know, at that time, the Masjids weren't big, tall structures. So they set a tent up in the masjid for him. So he comes, he, st he stops there for a little while, and then he gets back on Faswa, and now he rides into Arafat. And this is where, you know, he makes the khutbah, 
and we're going to go over those later. And there are many khutbat or many sermons that he gave during this time period. Uh, but this is, you know, one of the well-known ones. And so we'll, again, we'll go over that one later, inshallah. And then he, you know, he makes Dhuhr Salat and he combines with it Asr Salat. So he makes Dhuhr two rakat and then Asr two rakat. Right. And this again is his authority. You know, somebody could say, well, he's traveling. Well, he was traveling before, he didn't combine any of the other Salat. You know, if you look at all the other Salat, he made them all separately. But here he makes these two together. You know, the time of, between Asr and Maghrib is a special time. You know, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts the supplications of the believers. You know, there are certain times of the day that are more likely that your supplication will be accepted. You know, like the time in Juma between the khutbah and the salat. You know, very special time to be making dua. And there are other times like this as well. But every day, Asr, between Asr and Maghrib, is a special time for dua. So Rasulullah Sallallahu he, in effect, he lengthens that time for dua on the day of Arafat. Because he makes dua and Asr together, now between Asr and Maghrib, you know, is a long time. So make as much dua as you can. And again, he's making this dua, and all of his dua are for whom? Or for, for who? For his ummah. Asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, forgive the ummah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this, on this day, he, he promises the Rasulullah that I will forgive your whole ummah except for the oppressors. And so Rasulullah he says, Ya Allah, you have the authority to forgive even the oppressors and to fulfill, you know, or to compensate those who are oppressed. So this bargaining is going on you know, between the lover and the beloved, and the lover and the beloved. The, even the, uh, you know, because the oppressor, the dhalim, Allah SWT says that there is no curtain between the dua of the oppressed and Allah. You know, when he raises his hands against the oppressor, Allah SWT says there is no curtain between him and the oppressed. And yet here, Rasulullah says, Ya Allah, even forgive the oppressor. This is Rahmatul Al-Alameen. Mercy to all of creation. All of the worlds. Everything. Nothing can exist without the mercy of Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa has created Rasulullah as that mercy. So our existence is dependent on the existence of Rasulullah <laughs> Otherwise we would not exist. <laughs> this is also when the verse of the Quran, الْيَوْمَ أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي وَرَدِيدَ لَكُمْ إِسْلَامَ دِينَ that this day we have perfected for you your religion. We have fulfilled our prom or up or or our uh, uh, or our blessings upon you, and have chosen Islam as your way. So this verse was revealed on this day, and this is why later on Omar Radiyan would say that that day was two Eids for us. We'll go, again, we'll go over that later. For those who say, oh, you know, there are only two Eids. Uh, you know, there's Eid al-Adha and Eid al-Fitr. Well, Omar Radio says there's two Eids on one day, which is not Eid al-Adha, because it's the day before Eid al-Adha, nor is it Eid al-Fitr. So uh, should we accept those who claim that, oh, there are only two Eids in Islam, you know, those two, or do we accept uh, what Omar Radiyan says, and above that, do we accept what Rasulullah said when he said that, you know, that Friday is Eid al-Mu'mineen? 
You know, it is Eid for the believers every Friday. So, dua continues until Maghrib. When the sun sets, the Rasulullah system sets out from Arafat. And during this time, there are many people who are coming and asking the Rasulullah system, you know, about the Hajj again. You know, what is the Hajj? And this is where he says, you know, that the Hajj is to stay in Arafat. It's simply to wait in Arafat. That is the Hajj. That is it. To the extent in one narration, he says that even if someone is coming for the Hajj and he can't reach Arafat, but he gets close enough to where he can throw a stone into Arafat, you know, before the time is up, his, he's completed his Hajj. All of the other arkan or all of the other aspects of the Hajj, there is compensation for them. You know, if you miss something, you can compensate this way or that way. With the exception of Arafat. If you miss Arafat, then you got to do the Hajj again because you didn't do the Hajj. And he said that Hajj is to come, that anyone who comes into Arafat before, before dawn on the 10th of Zil Hajj, he has done Hajj. Even though Rasulullah he sets out at Maghrib, but he says he gives them time until Fajr starts. So this is the most important aspect of the Hajj. And, and there's no, there's, you know, as far as coming into Arafat, there's nothing, oh, you have to make this Salat, or you have to do this Dua, or that Dua, or nothing. There's no obligation on anything else. It's simply coming and standing in Arafat. You know, and we're going to talk about this later, it's about why simply being there is so important. How simply remembering the place, and then above remembering the place, being there. What should that? What should what? All should that bring within you? Why is that so significant? That that is the Hajj. You know, literally, that is the Hajj. You can skip over everything else, and again, there's compensation for everything else except for this one thing. So why is it so significant? And if I ask somebody, okay, what did Ibrahim al Islam do in, in Arafat? Because all the other arkan or all the other obligations of Hajj are connected to Ibrahim al Islam. Except for this one. Because if I ask somebody, okay, what did he do? They can't tell me anything. All he did was he he came there, but why did he come there? He wasn't doing his own sunnah, he was following somebody else's sunnah. You know, the sacrifice, the, the, the sa'i between Safa and Marwa, all of these are connected to directly to Ibrahim al-Islam or Ismail al-Islam or Bibi Hajar. Arafat is not. And within Arafat, you have Jabal al-Rahman, the mountain of mercy. Again, Rasulullah says, is Rahmatul al-Alameen. He is the mercy to all of creation. So obviously, these things have connections, and they are reminding us of something. So we need to remember what they're reminding us of. Uh, us of. The, so when he sets out from, from Arafat as Maghrib starts, he does not make Maghrib in Arafat. He sets out from Muzdalfa. And then on the way and along this part of the journey, Osama bin Zaid radiallahu anh, accompanies him on, on, on Qaswa. Oh, thing I forgot. When that verse was revealed, al akmaltu lakum dinakum, was, was revealed, Qaswa, which was the only camel of Rasulullah SAW, who when the Qur'an would be revealed, she could continue to move. But when this verse was revealed, and the Rasulullah SAW was sitting on her back, even she had to sit down. Because of the weight of revelation. We, we pick up the Qur'an and we read the Qur'an like it's something 
very easy or something very light. The reality of this is this something very heavy. And this is where the hadith of Thaqalain, where Rasulullah said that I'm leaving two very heavy things behind. The Quran and my itrat, my Ahlul Bayt, my progeny. You know, the hadith and say Muslim, Quran and itrat. My itrat, my progeny. Says, and they will always be together. Time's up. We'll continue from here next week, inshallah. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us understand. Uh, and, uh, you know, for those who are going for Hajj, inshallah, soon, may He, uh, you know, make the journey easy and make all the issues that are coming up easy for, for them, inshallah. Uh, and, uh, and also for those who aren't going this year, may, it, may He make it easy for us to go soon, inshallah. And fill our hearts with his true love and the true love of his beloved Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, his family, his companions, and all those whom they love. Inshallah, those who have not made sunnah going make sunnah.